My guest today is Max Lee. He's the founder of Air Wallets, a $5.5 billion company based in Hong Kong. He's going to share his knowledge with us today. Today's podcast is brought to you in partnership with Hong Kong Broadband Network. They are a purpose-driven telco and a digital transformation solutions leader with operations in Hong Kong, Macau, mainland China and Southeast Asia. And they are a firm believer in change or die. And it's my honor to have them as a sponsor for the podcast today. This special episode of the Unicorn Podcast is in partnership with Start Me Up Hong Kong. The Start Me Up Hong Kong Festival is Asia's leading annual startup event curated by Invest Hong Kong. Returning in hybrid format this year from the 5th to the 10th of September under the theme, A Future Unlimited. If you happen to have missed the festival when listening to this podcast, you can catch all the highlights to the event in the links below. Max, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Perhaps we could start off by you telling the audience a little bit about yourself. Thanks for having me here, Simon. Um, sure. So my name is Max. I'm one of the co-founders of Airwallex. We are a company that focuses on building um, financial infrastructure for business around the world for help to help them expand their businesses. And in the company, I'm currently taking care of product design. Now, you are a Hong Kong unicorn, and I know uh, Hong Kong is very proud of you and what you've achieved. But perhaps let's go back to the beginning. How did you start this business? How did this idea come about? There was a bit of a a story there. So I was originally born in China and having um, going to um, Australia for high school and university. After graduation, I actually had a degree in architecture like building um, brick and mortar buildings, if you like. And after that, I was um, kind of graduating right into the financial crisis. Um, and it was not, um, the job market was not particularly hot. But what was hot was the concept, the, 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 the buzzword that flowed around was startup. Everybody who um, got any access to social media start to heard about this word. And for kids our generation, it was kind of this dream state. Um, status to get into. Now, since the um, after working in several design studio, I thought, uh, why don't I give it a go? So I become like a constant hustler, starting a few gigs here and there. And one of the gigs that I landed on was when I met Jack, our CEO of Airwalks. Uh, we started a cafe together. Now, looking back, it didn't. Um, sound like a super radical idea, but we had this kind of approach that we think cafe was the best way to connect um, retail and the spirit of the city because there's so much interaction happening. So with that kind of poetic approach, we started the cafe. Now, the second you started the business, there's nothing poetic that happened ever since. So everywhere you, we, 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 we look, there was so much friction. And one of the key major friction that we had was um, to do with money. So when you um, deal with, we start a business, small business, uh, whenever we're trying to, for instance, um, uh, source some packaging from overseas, we use a traditional remitter and we calculated there was like something like 5% or 7% cost that um, we got charged on top of the packaging. Now, if you're starting out and you, you start with like a small kind of budget, 5%, 7% was crazy. So out of like surprise came, denial came, like inspiration. So while we were working on that startup, um, the idea to create a a um, platform to help this business doesn't matter what size you are. You're trying to expand. You're trying to um, look at the global game. Became our inspiration, and one thing led to another. We started um, Airwallex. It's quite a big leap to go from a cafe business to um, a business like Airwallex, and and so. Did it not intimidate you? I mean, to to go that 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 way as opposed to perhaps, for example, you know, do more cafes or like do coffee distribution or like you know, that sounded like the more natural way to go. Um, was, was it scary at first, or did it feel like quite a natural next step? I think, in all honesty, it's scary at first, and it's scary every day since. Um, mm. 
it, you're right. It's it, the, the the leap from um, a cafe to a kind of a, a player in the financial industry is such a big jump that um, there is kind of you can't see a, a, a linear trajectory, right, from point A to point B. But um, and hence, every day is scary. You always face some unknown challenge. There is a new concept. There is a new trend that you have never heard about, and you just quickly googling as you are trying to push the company towards the next step. But along the way, I have this um, um, again back to my own reflective self that um, as uh, someone who went through an architecture school. Um, for me, anything that we can call a structure is architecture for me. So as long as like we can uh, focus on how do we build up something and it stands the test of time, for me, that is a very similar mindset and goal. And um, in that regard, there was not much difference between the brick and mortar architecture and the cafe and what we are doing right now. I think it's really great insight there i don't want my audience to miss that it's almost like um you, it doesn't matter what background you come from you so your architectural background you're applying basically it's just structure so i think people listening you can start a cafe or you can start a billion dollar company doing what you're doing and actually the structure is the same right it's just yeah. scale sometimes isn't it and and so but you've raised a lot of money um, and I'm sure, you know, how did is this something you, you learned along the way as well, or all of these elements you need to build up a business? Have you learned it along the way? Or how have you, did you bring in a lot of experts in the early days? How did you, how did you learn these things quicker? I think in the very beginning, we were very um, blessed with a, a group of co-founders that um, each bringing different expertise into the picture. Um, along the ways, um, you meet great people. You meet um, people who share your passion and you just grow your team. Um, funding was like definitely one of those topics. Um, one didn't understand why you need so much money or how to approach the concept of money. And um, as at the same time as growing and focusing on your businesses. But along the ways, you, you realize that it's not a, a individualistic game. It is a, um, um, you mentioned the word structure, even the people aspect. It is a structural challenge and an and opportunity, so to speak, to grow together with, with, with the people that you meet along the way. Now you mentioned this um, opening up the cafe in Melbourne. It was right with with Jack, yeah. your co-founder. Um, and did the structure for that cafe end up being the same structure for Air Wallet? Yes and no. I, I, if I trying to retrospectively tell the story, there is always a a, a narrative angle that I can somehow squeeze it in. Um, I can argue that. Um, the whole uh, the, the 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 cafe as well as this um, air wallex you there is no um, there is a similarity in that you always need to test out your ideas with a single or a few customers in the beginning and then you see how you can grow but in reality when you actually um, like few years down the track you of course you see very very different day-to-day -day trajectories along the lines yeah, and I like the vision of Airwallex reading about it. This kind of provides straightforward, cheaper foreign exchange. Is this something that you 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 know you stuck to along the whole journey? I mean, you started this business in 2015. I know a lot of people listening; they have an idea and then it changes and evolves. Did you did you know that that was the path to stick to? Did you get distracted potentially? What's your thinking on on these kind of fixed business plan uh, plays? I think that's a very great question. Um, I think they, they call this pivot. They use the term pivot to describe the situation where your original business plan may or may not um, work out along the way. Um, I, I think I'm going to answer you this way. So I'm always amazed by there was a, a, a type of founders that look at the future with a very um, deterministic view. So they, they have this uh, very fixated, um, high um, confidence vision of the future. Um, I, I, there are plenty of successful um, founders like that. I think I'm a, 
I'm less of that person. I'm more of a person who look at the future um, in a set of um, scenarios and likely scenarios and attach them with um, probabilities. And as a business, you kind of need to attach your commitment, your time, your resources to these um, high, highly likable events so that um, you you give it all your heart and hopefully it turn out the way that you want them to be. Now, does it mean that the along the way this um, uh, trajectory may change? Uh, yes, it is highly likely, especially given the macro and sometimes the micro change may may change in ways you can never predict. But all you get is your kind of constant um, view on what are those likely. Um, events, what are the likely um, probabilities you can work with? So for that, I think um, for doesn't matter what startup business you're dealing with, that that kind of um, um, fixated vision of the future should remain kind of loyal to yourself. I think it's something that a lot of founders struggle with, though, because even now, I'm sure with scale that you've now reached, I mean, last time I read you in 19 countries, you've got a team of over uh, 1,200 people. I mean, this is a huge, huge company now. There must be temptation sometimes to add another layer, another product type on there. And, and you know, almost learning to say no must be, uh, I think, one of the traits um, of, a, of a successful founder. Do you agree? Um, 100%. Uh, learning to say no and also um, agreeing on why we made the decision so that hopefully we can make the same, not necessarily the same decision next time, but we should have a reliable framework to make similar decisions along the way. Now, if you start your business with like two people, five people, um, that decision a lot of time is relying on the uh, uh, charming personalities of your yourself and your co-founders. But along the ways you realize that that kind of saying no it can't be a, a personal decision, less of a personal decision, more of a, you need to find some kind of a programmatic way to make that, if that makes sense, so that you can push the the company forward. Um, but what you said was true. It's, it's a real struggle. I, I think it's the temptation of um, the future that, that, that drags people to, to, to make these kind of decisions over and over again. Yeah, and as you say, in startup world, we all talk about pivot all the time as if it's something we should be doing quite often. Um, and, and so, yeah, staying true to the, to the cause is, is, is not easy. Is your um, family background entrepreneurial? I mean, a lot of people listening, you know, I guess perhaps want to relate. Um, it, were your parents entrepreneurs? Did, they, did you get support from your network when you decided to go on this crazy venture? Yes and no. Um, so my parents, them personally, they work uh, government jobs, um, very stable. Um, there was not really much entrepreneurship in their um, careers. However, um, I, per, my personal story is that I grew up in the city of Shenzhen, right next to Hong Kong. And there was, um, if you look at the history of Shenzhen, um, it was this city that was almost... Um, um, designated as an experimental hub, um, as an uh, as a way to open up to the whole world, and for that, I grew up with the environment of um, a very fast pace of change, and everything is possible, and failure is also possible, but you never kind of want to back down from trying. And, and you know, for those that are listening in in the UK or in 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 America. Um, I was just reading Shenzhen has 90%, over 90% of the world's patents. Oh, really? um, and, and it's kind of the si Silicon, yeah, Silicon Valley of, 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 of China, of course, you know, like it, it's, and, and, and that's a really good point. I mean, you grew up in an environment where failure was quite normal. People are trying things there, aren't they? They're developing products that don't work yet and um, pushing the envelope. And I think that's something a lot of the rest of the world don't know, by the way. Um, so yeah, what, what about your co-founder? How, how has that relationship worked? I mean, I think a lot of people, I, I love having a co-founder. Um, but I also know a lot of people that find having, you know, being a sole founder to be quite good. And what's your, your experience being the Jack will probably listen to this. So you've got to be nice about him, I'm sure. But, uh, but, uh, what's your experience being having a co-founder? I think 
having uh, the co-founders we have, um, Jack, Xi Jinping, Lucy, um, I think that's the biggest asset or luck that we had in the beginning and that um, we each kind of contribute to this mix in, 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 in our different ways that um, you not necessarily agree with each other. Actually, um, mo- almost all, always we disagree with each other. But there is also that um, as your business grow bigger, the amount of um, things you need to deal with just grow um, dramatically more complicated. And it is... Um, um, you really can benefit, I think, as early co-founders of um, uh, entrepreneurs, you can really benefit from someone who can kind of complement uh, your skill set and your viewpoints. Um, I, I think that's just tremendous um, in, in, in your journey. I think this is another great point you're making there, Max. Again, I, I don't want my audience to miss the nuance of what you've just said there because I've had a similar experience. I, I got into business with my um, my. Well, we ended up being my wife, but she was my friend. We got into business together, started a company. And I, and everybody told me it was going to be a disaster, that working with a friend would be a disaster. Um, it didn't turn out to be a disaster. We ended up getting married. It was great. But um, I think the key reason that we were successful, and sounds like you had a similar experience, was you had a different skill set, same moral code. Different skill sets, same moral code, right? So you you listen to each other, you respect each other, you have different areas that you work on, but you 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 are able to um, go together on the journey, as opposed to perhaps two people working in the same skill set might might have friction uh, with each other. Do you think that's true? Hundred uh, percent. I think I think the the friction that you mentioned is very real in a lot of relationships you know, entrepreneurial or not. And the the general rule of thumb is that a group of people need to go to the right direction and at the uh, right speed. Um, and if you have that um, kind of generally same directionness um, for your team, um, whatever your dynamics is with your uh, co-founders, I think that's that's definitely a, a added benefit. To, to increase, dramatically increase your uh, success um, possibility. And in the early days when you were setting up the company, again, I know people listening will be asking themselves this question. Did you do uh, shareholders agreements? Did you have very clear definitions of, of like who's responsible for what and equity split? Did, did, that, did you spend a lot of time on that? Um, we made some of the um, like the shareholding etc quite clear in the beginning but in terms of responsibility I think that was harder to define and in all honesty it evolved a lot over time so I was conscious to introduce myself as someone who's taking care of design right now but knowing that I have put on different hats um, over time. So that responsibility split, etc., was definitely agreed upon in the beginning. But as the company grew and as the kind of situations we need to deal with um, changes over time, that, that definitely um, evolved. And I think what I've noticed, um, you know, on, on your LinkedIn profile, which is very straightforward, um, you know, you've kind of got your, uh, you know, your co-founder and product at Airwallex, and then you changed it in 2020 to co-founder and head of design at Airwallex. Because as your business grows, I guess everyone needs to become no longer a generalist, become more specialist. Like what is the area that you want to work on? What area do you enjoy working on? What area can you bring the most impact on? Right? Is, is that what happened internally? As the business has grown, you, you've had to define the role a bit more clearly for yourselves. Yes. Um, make impacts is, um, make effective impacts is definitely, I think, um, is something that we hold dearly as a value for the company that you always find the most impactful angle for you to um, work on so that the company can can grow at a very healthy state um, there is a always a um, um, inertia individually speaking that you may want to stick to your old role that your or, or original frame that got you to where you are today um, you may be very reliant on it psychologically but um, I think one of the key things about entrepreneurship is that you are you're looking at the future that that is what what is required of you um, yet to come that that is very key so I would um, agree with that um, find the most impactful um, way to 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 make a difference 
Now, I was reading online um, and, and just how many people love your product is is something to be proud of. But I was also reading that you've raised over 800 million US dollars and the last valuation on the company is 5.5 billion. Did you ever imagine that this would be where you're at when you started the business? Yes and no. Um, I don't think you... I don't think one goes to sleep one night and wake up the other morning with a 5.5B um, evaluation. In that regard, that it's crazy to think about. Um, I never, um, personally, I never thought about it um, until it happens. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's almost like you gradually, you, you set your objective, you gradually get there and the company grows, the amount of um, uh, 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 customers grows and the, the value, is, I, I think it's almost like a byproduct that um, we never got there in one step. It's the daily um, grinding one step at a time that got us there. Good parallel to coffee there, grinding, you know, like it's uh, making the coffee is a grind and, and building business. I mean, sometimes the word grind, I, I actually really like that word when it comes to building a business because sometimes entrepreneurship is glamorized, right? There's just, they just read the headlines, but this has been a long journey. When you, when you reflect on the journey, you look back at where you've, what, what you've gone through. Are there any lessons that jump out that you think would be useful for people to learn around shareholding, around partners, around raising money, around vision? Anything that jumps out that you, you wish you'd known this when you'd started kind of, kind of knowledge? That's a good question. Um, I think a key component in our company DNA is that we are very much driven by product and product thinking. So... Um, product thinking sounds like super conceptual and glamorized, um, but what it really does is that you, you really need to ask very honest, sometimes simple questions of what exactly you're trying to um, solve with your company. And that is a, that is a skill that you need to um, train up and, and, and you know, um, improve over time and day in, day out. Um, a lot of people when well certainly i was one of them when you start, uh, first um, started a a startup you have this great vision and you think you nailed it this time the the future is going to look great um, that is fine you need to have that confidence you need to have that commitment to your vision but the to get there to be able to drive yourself um, sometimes reluctantly so, and your team to get there, you need a very clear and almost like um, very um, serious mindset that, okay, at every point in time, are we building the right product? Are we talking to our customer? Do we understand what's happening? Like this kind of almost like um, um, humility to, 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 um, to, to reality, that's something that I didn't know. I, I, I was confident about myself until, until I started. And then every day you grow a little bit about, okay, there is a problem that I don't understand. Let's try to understand it. Have you had imposter syndrome throughout this process yourself? Oh, I, it's almost my job to, um, to do imposterization. Is that a word? Um, like I said, I was a coffee maker. I was a coffee maker. I was a designer, architect, turned coffee maker, turned many other things. Um, I l have since learned to embrace the imposter syndrome that I realized that it puts you in a particular perspective that um, because I almost like embrace that I'm an imposter, that by definition, I have to learn something from the real pros. So there are people who doesn't matter what uh, topic you, you, you mentioned, there's always someone who knows it better than I do. So t taking full ownership of that imposter um, kind of mindset, then I would really just dig and keep asking um, really kind of s silly questions. I, 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 to answer a question, yes, always. Yeah. Now, I love that. I think that's a really good thing for people listening that feel, oh, you know, I, I, um, 
this business, I I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not good enough. I'm not. But that's a really good way of putting it. Learn something from the pros then that do know. And and I and I also have an angle on on this imposter syndrome, which is if if you this the, the, in startup world they call it the fake it till you make it model, which which has positive and negative connotations, right? But I kind of like the idea that if we are going to fake it till we make it, we have to make it. And if we make it, we're not faking it anymore. So so following through. Right, like you're doing, you know, um, and sticking the course. But I think almost like it pushes you, doesn't it? If you, if people perceive you as this, uh, you know, successful entrepreneur, then almost you need to make it true, <laughs> uh, and it can push you to to get to the finish line, right? I mean, like how, what motivates you today? To to, I mean, you've been many years in this business now. What yep. motivates you to keep going? Um, I I think kind of linking back to the city I grew up with, Shenzhen, is that there was, growing up, there was a huge sense of the future um, happening that um, you never know exactly what that future looks like, but you have some theory and hope that it would turn out that way. So it's almost like you're finishing an episode of Game of Thrones and you know the next episode is going to be good, but you're not exactly sure exactly which scenario. You read some fan theories, but you're not exactly sure which theory is going to be true. And it's that kind of um, hope and anxiety, everything mixing up together that drives you to come back next week, right? And then you want to watch another episode. Like for me, that's what drives me. That almost like um, uh, naked anxiety, and an expectation of something good is going to come, but um, I may I may not be the one who drives it, but I want to feel the 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 breeze of the the wind from the tomorrow when it happens. So that gives me the the kick, if you like. I love that, and uh, I actually retired for two years, and and I spent those two years looking after my baby son who arrived and watching Netflix, and I always felt like. Netflix and and even Game of Thrones, which is a great series, none of these things have anything uh, like the same excitement as building a company of your own and making a difference in people's lives and helping them. And and so uh, anyone listening, you know, that enjoys Game of Thrones, building your own business is even more exciting. And you mentioned something else there, I think, really interesting, the future. You know, what does the future look like? Shenzhen is one of those places that, that, um, that does help you understand the future. What do you think of things like the metaverse and, and what do you see in the future that if people are listening and they're thinking, oh, I should get involved in, in a certain space, is there anything that you think, wow, that's a real opportunity and, and people need to be spending more time learning about it? 100%. That's a really great question. Um, I think it would be um, too abrupt to arrive at words such as metaverse or Web3 for me, because number one, I don't know what it may look like. There are, it's still a changing topic. Um, but for me, that that is like describing a solution already. Um, for me, what's the interesting thing here is to describe what the problem is um, or the trend is. I feel like the problem that um, the situation that we're in right now in the world encourages um, some form of decentralization. Um, if we keep it slightly conceptual. Now, um, to what extent this decentralization topics plays out or to what extent it manifests itself in different industries and ways of life, I'm not entirely sure, but it feels like um, the um, old days, if you like, of a single kind of institution dealing with every aspect of your um, uh, life, your your money, um, may, that may not be the vision going forward. So I think there th- that that trend is probably one of the bigger trends that um, would be entrepreneurs can pay attention to and of course with every thesis there is a a a counterpart to that is that i feel um regulation the topic of how do you consider um your business relationship with um local governments um etc that's very big topic um that um you can see a lot of startup opportunities that spring from it so i would say that looking to both sides of the coin and there is a a vision of the future there somewhere i totally grasp what you're saying um again i want my audience not to miss it 
Um, I agree with you. Decentralization is a really fascinating subject. People listening, if you don't know what we're talking about, go Google this. It's kind of, I think it's like, dare I say it, it's at least it's, uh, and, and without getting this episode uh, blocked somehow, but you know, platforms like Facebook not being owned by one individual, but by owned by, owned, owned by the community um, is one example of how it could play out. But I think what you're also saying is really interesting around like working with um, organizations that can help uh, further the good of things like um, uh, metaverse and other other technologies. And so I made a mistake in a business. I, I launched an equity crowdfunding platform in Hong Kong. And I was I made a mistake because I was very much like, well, this platform is needed to help startups get funding. So let's just go ahead and do it and forget regulation. And then we got we got shut down, actually. Um, whereas uh, my competition, they were very smart. They actually worked with the government and worked with certain organizations to ensure uh, that these platforms then worked. Um, and, and that was, that was actually a smart way to do it. You know, like, so sometimes people do, I think, think, you know, certainly entrepreneurs anyway, there's a tendency to say, Oh, you know, let's fight the system and change the world and, you know, build things that, you know, that, that take down the old infrastructure. And, and actually that's not, not, not always a good mantra at all. I think working with, with, as you say, regulators working with institutions, because they want to update too. Right. And actually, and I know this must be a sensitive area in your business and, and I don't want to say something where we have to cut it out of the podcast, but but that must have been one of the big challenges in your business. I mean, that that to me is one of the major differences between running a coffee shop and running what you're running. The regulation and the rules are quite intense, right? Um, that's very true. And I want to kind of echo what you said just now about the um, um, the almost like stereotypical uh, startup uh, mental model of like, you know, we want to fight the uh, uh, institution or whatever version of that statement. Um, I feel like mm -hmm. that um, that's missing an opportunity here is that whenever you build something new, um, sometimes you get a lot more help if you work with the rules of reality. So it's really... Mm -hmm. um, difficult to create something without any rules but with the uh, kind of restraints of 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 regulation is only one of them that you actually have a situation that there is a problem there's a clearer problem to solve and hence it's almost giving you a path towards um, a some kind of a uh, understanding some kind of a uh, 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 solution eventually on the other side of the thinking process. And I feel like that is not necessarily a bad thing for most businesses starting up. I agree completely. And it is something not talked about enough. Um, there is, the, again, the mentality. I mean, it's always talked about like brands like Uber have, you know, disrupted the taxi business. Well, actually, they didn't go around trying to disrupt the taxi business. That was not their model, you know. like they're... So, so it's, it's sometimes, you know, it's not good necessarily to cause wars. It's good to collaborate and, and just find your own space. I interviewed um, Tony Fidel, who invented the iPod. Yeah. And he was part of the team, of course, that then went on to invent the iPhone. And, and he said... Um, in, in, in the interview I had with him, he said, uh, fuck the metaverse. <laughs> he, he, he actually said that the metaverse was a distraction. And to your point, um, when, what is the real problem? And putting things like metaverse at the front is maybe the solution before we analyze the problem. His, uh, his argument, I'd be interested in what you th think of this, is he said that we've got enough problems in the real world. <laughs> Let's spend trillions in the real world um, fixing real world problems. And unless metaverse... Uh, can provide solutions to real world problems perhaps we should be diverting resources to real world problems anyway it's a controversial opinion um but yeah i think you know i don't, don't know if you have an opinion on this but it is an interesting one i thought that he had i i am a big fan of tony um i actually um reading his book right now um it's, it's a great book highly recommended for um anyone build yeah know. Yeah, it's a good book. Awesome book. Um, yeah. On the topic yeah. of metaverse, I have to confess, I do not know enough to have a really systematic answer for that. But I would not, um, I don't want to jump into conclusion by saying that this is a real problem or it is a fake virtual dream up, um, hyped up problem. Um, I feel like um, 
in the in the whole spectrum of of realities and different walks of life um there is not a necessarily that only the tangible or the 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 the, the more kind of um uh, immediate needs are are the problems to be solved there are many problems to be solved but i think we live in a day and age in which this diversity of problem to be solved this thesis itself is kind of the 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 seducing nature of the time we're living in is that you don't have to commit to um metaverse there are raw alternatives just as you can get yourself really deep into that world if that's what you truly think will move the needle of whatever your measure um as a business or the, as a as, as an entrepreneur but this is this is a it's, it might sound like we're going off track talking about metaverse but i think what what i'm what i'm seeing when you're describing the way you think is that you know you say what is the problem i think this is really interesting so when you looked at your business initially when you saw the problem you must have there must have been a lot of companies out there doing it already the solution this it feels like there was a lot of businesses with potential but they didn't have the distribution maybe um so did you feel like there was a lot of competition or did you think there was no competition and that's why um you you went into that space or as you got into it did you realize there was competition because when people look at business ideas they often get put off when they think well it's too hard or it's too much competition how did you deal with that kind of that that side of it psychologically um i think psychologically um it always requires a healthy sense of um um taking the leap of faith like if you over analyze everything you would probably unlikely to make any big decisions i think that's out of that kind of opinion is is probably very true but there is also the um you need to do your research you need to out there not just google and you need to get out there and actually look for ways to solve the problem that you can identify with um part of that initial story of the uh uh coffee uh business in which we think that the cost was a big friction is that um i was um doing research um um not because i wanted to because i wanted to save money and the solution we have um encountered that's available in the market back then we know a vision of that but i feel like it's never really taking for me because i have a maybe i have a a set of suppliers that are in different parts of the world and they're um and that part of world the the financial system was not really um optimized so you 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 start to build up these layers of understanding of the industry and you gradually find this place in which um yes there is on paper there's some solution to that but when it all combines together the pain point is still so obvious that um you just no way to uh, deny that the existing solution is shit so you you, you then you mm. take the leap of faith and do something about it um to address the competitor issue yeah mm interesting point you mentioned earlier um you were lucky how do you think luck plays a role in the success of a business um luck is um um without getting into metaphysical sense of the discussion i think luck is a probability that kind of drives the outcome that you like um that is huge in every single decision that people make regardless of startup or not um but i think there is a special um tool that entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurs have is that when you start your business um you may not be a very lucky person but you end up trying a lot so you have a lot of data points you have a lot of trial and error and statistically speaking if you never go out of business you you can keep trying until you hit that something that will get you to the success you want and unfortunately that keep trying phase a lot of people may be giving up too too much too early and the 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 luck aspect probably didn't play out so well but um to acknowledge on uh, any given moment um luck plays a role but it is your job to make it happen over time i love that explanation and um i think for people listening the way i i i i i translate what you're saying on my own personal experience too is that failure can actually be luck over time 
right? So if if you fail at something, you learn because of the data point to your point. And that failure can then lead you to success if you don't stop. <laughs> If you, if you stop and say, well, I tried and it failed, now I'm so unlucky. But later on, anyone that's actually succeeded will say, I'm so glad that that early prototype failed because we learned something, right? So then that luck is compounded by the more risk you take, the luckier you get almost, right? That's the equation. Yeah, the compounding effect of, of luck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, look, um, startup culture is something we get asked a lot about. And having done my research, it's something I feel like in your company, you've got a fantastic culture. How did you build up that culture? What, what, what was, did you have a strategy? Was it just the way you are? Um, how, the, how did you build up the culture of the business? Was there a strategy around it? Um, I think in the beginning, uh, when you don't have that many people, um, like five to 10 people, a culture is just um, a set of ways that you do things. Um, I... I, I tend to see us as um, like um, I have this really strange um, uh, example of the way you look at culture as like the um, you know the probiotics of the, that sense of the the culture in that we are no different from this kind of um, uh, individual um, elements, but then if you give the right environment, for instance, you give it warmth, you give it moisture. For some reason, they tend to grow in a certain way. Um, it's slightly visual image there, but I know. But um, I tend to think that as founders, over time, all you can do is to create an environment and the general direction. Maybe you lead by example. Maybe you communicate. Maybe you set it in stone in your in your um, uh, 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 kind of um, company um, internal emails. Um, probably you don't achieve it by hiring an external consultant and just decide something for you. But it has to be coming from yourself. And um, all you can do is really to ensure of that environment and the people, the collective, will gradually find their vibe and then go for that direction. Um, I don't believe that there is a definitive answer that a, a single founder or a, a group of founders can can just um, steer the culture uh, like like completely. Um, we can steer it to a certain degree, and we want them to be um, when I say them, the, the values to be more positive, to be more constructive. We should have like intellectual, honest discussions about uncomfortable product decisions, that kind of things. But in general, over time, that, that environment will grow itself and they form the, 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 the values will grow and form the, their own kind of um, um, form. Well, in, in, in the research that I did on the business, um, I, 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 the words that came through about your business were like transparent, honest, direct. Um, did you sit down and actually talk about the, the the moral code of the business or or, or these things that have, did you did you have a cultural conversation was that part of your business strategy um the the culture conversation was constant and very real um the part about for instance transparency and honesty um it's probably a byproduct of like every week almost every day we have this um product related conversations that um we 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 throw around very, very direct and sometimes not very um, nice um, challenges to each other. You know, like you have a proposal. Some people think this is awesome. The other people think that, yes, maybe where's the data? So you you end up constantly in this kind of conversation. We realize that there is not a um, definitive way to have those conversations, but to mention that, the transparency is a weapon, a tool that you can use in these conversations, ensures that these conversations can continue to happen. So you don't shut each other down by your position. You, um, you don't take it personally. You try not to take it personally. And you just really engage in the conversation of the company and the product and the directions we're going through. So I think that's the constant conversation we have. 
I like that. And I, I like the um, the point, the analogy, I guess, you've made with the probiotics. Because uh, anyone that takes probiotics, which I do too, when you first take you actually have a stomach issue. You know, blah, 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 blah. lots of, you know, initially sounds like disruption. Uh, but eventually that disruption is what creates the good bacteria. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's, that internal disruption is as important as the external disruption, right? Challenging each other. You know, but what does, what does honesty mean? What does transparent mean? Right? Like th- those sorts of, uh, difficult conversations, because of course it's hard to be transparent about everything. You don't necessarily want to share with your clients all the bugs that you have with the business. Um, but you want to share with them the solutions, right? So it's very hard, isn't it? Uh, to, to, to get, to, to find what these, what these, um, cultural words mean and put them into practice. But I like your analogy of probiotics. I think that's a great way of putting it. If, um, you went back, I guess this, um, the last two questions for you now, um, if you went back to your younger self and gave some advice, uh, what, what would it be? I was, I would suggest my younger self to read more books. Um, it sounds like a simple ask, but, um, okay. I, I feel like generally speaking, books can be, or knowledge can be categorized into information focus um, mental model focus or um, narrative focus. That's a very rough categorization. Um, my younger self um, will want to as much utility out of knowledge as possible. So I tend to focus a lot of uh, on, on information. I want to get the best bang out of book, uh, about, uh, out of the book uh, reading. But when you start to do um, uh, entrepreneurs, you start to do um, startups, you, you, you tend to see that there are so many superpowers that you can't get from information alone, such as like the, the power, the superpower to tell a really good narrative. Now, if I knew how important it was, I would have spent more time on, you know, Harry Potter or Dune. Like that, that would give me a lot more edge uh, down the track, but you wouldn't know until you've been through it that um, the challenges you face is probably requires a whole um, um, combination set of um, random skills that you would you weren't aware of um, um, the importance of. And 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 I think read books and don't be too picky about it is probably a shortcut towards that. I like that. Not to be too picky about it. Maybe um, we can grab off you uh, the five books you love the most that have helped you and we'll put them in the links in the podcast notes below for people to uh, maybe get a, a glimpse of a few that you like um so we'll grab them off you at the end of the podcast um my final question uh for, for you is um you know you read your profile of course you you grew up in shenzhen um you know, and, and you've you've gone on to kind of create this international business frankly loved uh by by your customers and and um and and, and of course very valuable um so on paper it's 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 pretty amazing what you've done you and your team max um but you personally do you have any regrets wow that is a that's a good question um i have to say no to that. I have not got regrets. I'm going to try to elaborate the thinking behind that. I think regrets almost suggest that there is an alternative universe in which is more preferable to the current one that you end up with. You know, um, like the current reality um, is that um, the LLX is enjoying um, some amount of success and the alternative universe may be reality, maybe that I'm enjoying uh, much more personal time, um, you know, that kind of things. Um, I would have to say that my mental model is not, doesn't work like that. I feel like um, the only reality um, possibility you have is the right now and the decision that you have for the future. And regret is something that triggers a, a kind of um, almost a deconstruction of the problem-solving mindset that I have that I don't tend to venture into that area of the psyche. Like if you do a design, maybe it's shit, but you don't regret it because the only thing you can do then is the next design, isn't it? That 
regretting whether or not it's useful or not is out of the question. But that mental framework doesn't really work with.、Um, I don't think it works with entrepreneurial entrepreneurship in general. When I asked Tony Fadell that. He said、uh, he regretted not going to see Steve Jobs before he died. Steve Jobs、oh. invited him to go and see him, and I think、yeah. so. What? What? Sometimes it's quite good to keep an eye on this, I guess, and people listening as well. You know, like I think we only regret what we don't do. And I actually love your、um, process of thinking. Like you are doing a product, and if it's not brilliant, so what? You don't regret doing it. And I think, but but you don't regret doing it because you did it. And I think you know when Tony Vidal re- reviewed his whole life, the only regret he didn't regret that he worked nonstop for ten years. He didn't regret that. He regretted that he had the opportunity to see someone he admired and loved, and he didn't. And by the time、uh, he thought, you know, he, he, he could have gone and seen, it was too late.、Um, kind of idea. So don't you regret what you don't do? Was the conclusion I took from from that? I I, I think. In light of what you just shared, I, I think I would like to take a note and revisit this、um, rather confident、um, narrative I just spit out、um, rather irresponsibly.、Um, I may revisit this mindset sometime in the future, but right now,、um, I think my my vibe、um, would I would choose to stand by my vibe. Yeah, no, I I get it, and it's but it's it's a great vibe. I love it,、uh, Max. I really like the way that you explain things, and I'm I'm super honoured that you've come on the podcast and shared your your knowledge, and I'm in awe of what you and your team have done. And、um, thank you, Max, for sharing your story with us today. I really enjoyed talking to you. No, thank you very much. I enjoyed that, Simon. I hope you found today's podcast both inspiring and useful. And if you need more help, visit purposefulproject.com, where all the resources to help you start and grow a business are free.